It was a great pleasure to be invited to deliver this paper on the role of internationalisation along the path to excellence at the third international conference of the Russian Association of Higher Education Researchers, entitled The Birth and Revival of Universities in October 2012. It is, of course, no accident that a meeting such as that was convened by the National Research University Higher School of Economics and that so many took the trouble to attend and be involved. The Higher School of Economics has developed strongly and extremely quickly since Yevgeny Yasin, Yaroslav Kuzminov and other leading economists founded it in 1992. And its outward-facing international collaborative approach is central to its increasing success. The Hong Kong University of Science and Technology has what it likes to call its little secret, the secret that lies behind its spectacular success since 1991. And central to that is what its former president Paul Chu described as going global unencumbered by the weight of tradition. That, well, might be a slogan for the approach we have taken at my own institution, the University of Essex, too. The University of Essex is situated a little outside London, close to the east coast of England. It's an unspoiled area of the country, a largely rural haven, though retaining all the benefits of being so close to the capital city. Essex is one of seven universities that were established in the mid-1960s. Michael Belloff's description of these as the plate-glass universities is a rather dismal characterisation for a group of universities that has, in less than half a century, achieved really outstanding results. Our own founding Vice-Chancellor, Sir Albert Sloman, provided a detailed analysis of what the new universities of the 1960s could achieve in his BBC Wreath Lectures of 1963. Titled A University in the Making, Sloman wanted to provide an experience of living as well as an opportunity for learning, unhampered by precedents and established structures. And that freedom to establish new modes of operation is very likely why three of Belloff's plate glass universities, Warwick, York and Essex, were ranked in the top 10 in the UK in the research assessment exercise of 2008. At Essex, it is the social sciences and humanities that rank most highly in the UK's research assessment. If the University of Essex was to be unhampered by an outdated modus operandi, it would need to find its own set of guiding principles. Those developed in the Wreath Lectures and then put into operation during its first 15 years were summarised by the University's fourth Vice-Chancellor, Sir Ivor Crewe, in celebrating our 40th anniversary in 2004. He said this, Sir Albert Sloman's ambition was to create a university that was international, interdisciplinary and inclusive, breaking down barriers between nations, disciplines and social hierarchies. And those precepts have reverberated and modulated in the meantime, leaving an indelible imprint on what we have become today. For example, by 2008, the proportion of non-UK students at Essex had reached about 40% and the proportion of international faculty was over a third. Taken together, these two facts made us one of the top 20 most internationalised university communities in the world. As our fifth Vice-Chancellor, it was one of Professor Colin Reardon's first actions to lead the development of a new strategic vision, and internationalisation was placed firmly at the heart of that. In so doing, we were not so much changing direction as recognising something about ourselves that had always been important. Having it written up in this way, however, made us much more reflective in thinking through what internationalisation means for us and much more deliberate in the steps we take to pursue a global agenda. In this we are hardly alone. The international dimension has become arguably the most significant priority within higher education sectors across the globe. At present, of course, other major priorities concern the maintenance and preservation of our higher education systems in the face of worrying economic realities 
and unhelpful political contexts. The need to cope with ever more invasive external pressures that go beyond any reasonable notion of accountability. Outside these imperatives, however, it is hard to identify an area that a university would see as more relevant to its long-term mission than its place in the world. Globalisation has, however, become almost a cliché. It is certainly overestimated. In his book World 3.0, Pankaj Gemawat of the IESE Business School in Spain assesses that the world is at most only semi-globalised. Only 3% of us live and work outside our country of birth. Only 1% of US companies have a foreign presence. Only 20% of internet traffic crosses national boundaries. Compare this with the regular business of our universities. Compare, for example, that 3% of international workers with the 35% at Essex and ask yourself if four in five web pages you and your colleagues view come from within your own country. Universities worldwide are not so much travelling in the wake of broader globalisation as leading it from the front. So let me in this spirit speak about my university's current approach to internationalisation. I want to concentrate mainly on our approach to collaboration through our International Alliance project, which has created an intimate network of three universities and with which we are building strong collaborations in research, education, student exchange and community engagement. But let me begin with the overall space of possibilities. In the diagram, the bottom left-hand corner contains the large, essentially anarchic space of individual international academic links. At Essex, a very large proportion of our scholarly activity involves international partnerships, in terms of both academic publications and research income. And this activity is spread across almost as many countries as are represented by our academic staff. Such has been the historic levels of international activity that further internationalisation at Essex is definitely not a matter of increasing the amount of international research and educational engagement, and it has certainly little to do with the recruitment of fee-paying international students. It is rather about ensuring that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and it is about concentration. That is, it is focused on the quality, not the quantity, of our international activities. The top left of my diagram covers multilateral but narrowly focused collaborations. Centred largely on research groups in international consortia, these activities are more formally planned and managed. In the bottom right corner of the diagram we have bilateral institutional links that are broadly based. That broad base may represent a range of academic areas or a range of activities, for example research or curricular links or student mobility and so forth. These relationships are formally planned and managed, and we have seen a migration from the left to the right-hand side of the diagram, as we have recognised previously unnoticed patterns of activity within the more unplanned activities of individuals and groups. The top right corner of the diagram represents the most deliberate component of our international strategy, the alliance. Our thinking here has changed a little over the last few years, but our current objective is to establish very close working relationships with just two other universities. These are the University of Constance in Germany, a member of the German Excellence Initiative, and the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, India, recently judged India's premier research university. Whether we extend this alliance in the future with another member remains an open question, but we are determined that the network should be real deep and committed. At present we have around a dozen variously funded research projects active across the network in almost as many areas. We have established a joint master's programme with a number of others in progress. There has been a good level of student movement with, we insist, much higher levels of participation to follow. We want to establish in time a distinctive entity that changes us, the member universities, in the process. And we are learning a lot from our partners. For example, we have significantly improved our approach to student mobility from studying the outstanding work in this area at the University of Constance. 
In British education, schooling used to be underpinned by what were somewhat misleadingly known as the three R's, reading, writing and arithmetic. And I'm afraid that alliteration did not translate well into Russian during my presentation. Our approach at Essex to international strategy is underpinned and conditioned rather less economically by eight R's. These principles do not set out specific objectives or aims, rather they set out overarching values that should condition the collaborations. And I'd like to take these eight R's one by one. The first R is for research focus. We agree with Nigel Thrift and others who are involved in deep international institutional alliances. Our network should be based on shared intellectual interests and academic achievements. We are a leading research institution and what attracts both faculty members and students to Essex are those strengths. Research activity is the glue that holds us together and shapes most of what we otherwise do. Shared interests among partners, likewise, should form the substrate upon which alliance activities are built. The second R is for resonance. In building a network, we could seek partners who substantially mirror our own strengths and interests, creating a larger version of ourselves in the process. Alternatively, we could seek partners who boast strengths in areas we entirely lack, creating a more comprehensive entity a sort of super university. Neither of these is what we're looking to do. What in fact we want is resonance, that's to say complementary expertise, whether in research, teaching or knowledge exchange, that for all partners builds and extends our individual strengths and interests. Peter Koklanis, director of the Global Research Institute at the University of North Carolina, introduced an idea he calls intellectual arbitrage. In finance, of course, an arbitrage opportunity is based on a difference in value of a commodity when transferred from a market in which it has a lower value to one in which it has higher value. Intellectual arbitrage concerns the value of academic capacity available within one partner organisation for another partner which otherwise lacks that capacity. Such capacities might be physical resources, say instrumentation or laboratories, or natural resources, it might involve access to field sites or specialised human resources, the expertise and experience of faculty members. We all operate within the limits of our available resources. Today more than ever we feel and bump up against those limits ourselves. In developing higher education sectors, for example in Africa, those limits have always been present, but none of us can afford to expand and extend freely. The arbitrage opportunities arising through resonant collaborations create additional capacity for resonant partners and allow us to take advantage of new opportunities that would not otherwise be available. The third R is for reciprocity. It is almost an embarrassment to have to underline this. The activities of the network should be mutually beneficial to all participants. It is remarkable that this doesn't go without saying. In an interesting article entitled Nine Problems That Hinder Partnerships in Africa, John Holm and Leps Maletti from the University of Botswana note that Western academics often assume control of joint research projects, manipulating resources, both human and natural, and thus disrupt and exploit the local agenda. At the Jawaharlal Nehru University in India, we learnt of even more devious exploitative tactics, where what looked like genuine research collaborations with an international partner university ended abruptly once that partner had lured away talented students and postdoctoral researchers to their own research groups. This is not at all convivial. JNU is, of course, one of our international alliance partners, and we have very strong links with the University of Botswana, Considerable work has been required to assure them that mutuality is a core value for us. The fourth R is for relationships. We certainly agree with Colin Grant when he was at the University of Surrey that tight multilateralism conditions the relationship between partners in our network. But we want to say somewhat more about relationships within the network. We want each bilateral partnership to be broadly based across many disciplines. This maximises the multilateral permutations. 
However, in addition to this horizontal integration across disciplines, we want to establish vertical integration throughout the governance structures. That's to say, strong relationships between leaders, senior managers and department heads. Through such multidimensional relationships, we aim to create circumstances in which networked institutions understand their weaknesses and threats as much as their strengths and opportunities. By building up trust and understanding between those within universities who are charged with the institutional strategy, management and, of course, the financial resources. Given this level of strategic intimacy, taking bold decisions that might otherwise be considered too risky become real possibilities. The fifth R is for reputation. Built on the reputation of its constituent institutions and based on resonant activities, the Alliance should itself create a unique profile and establish an international visibility of its own. The sixth R is for responsiveness. The partners in the network are necessarily geographically distributed. There are limits to how often and how many face-to-face -face meetings can take place. Infrequent visits require considerable planning and resource and are justified only when the quantity and nature of the business is commensurate with the effort of setting them up. Moreover, they have to be more overtly managed and approved, and we do not want to fall into the trap described admirably by Nigel Thrift, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Warwick, that lead to networks that, quote, provide a sense of international involvement and inclusion without doing much except making dents in the travel budgets of presidents and provosts. But we can address this with the use of technology. By harnessing the vast array of technology at our disposal, we can ensure rapid and agile communication, not simply for pursuing academic activities, but also for governance as well. Agile governance could be crucial for supporting and developing worthwhile educational and scholarly activities. The seventh R is for responsibility. This is, I think, also really crucial and is again linked with conviviality. The responsibility for Alliance activities should be devolved to the faculties, departments, research groups and individuals that can best direct and lead them. I earlier described the academic activities of the Alliance as cutting horizontally across the institutions and the governance activities as slicing vertically through them. The latter is really essential for supporting the former effectively and ensuring self-determination and control of the agenda at the appropriate level is crucial. The eighth and final R is for reach. Our international collaborations should never be exclusive, ruling out other international links. Collaborators, members of the Alliance, should continue to reach out to work with the wider international community as they see fit. A closely bound network of institutions like our Alliance will fulfil many objectives, but it is very unlikely to fulfil them all. We must ensure that activities within the Alliance, however convivial in themselves, do not rule out worthwhile activities outside. In terms of strategy, then, these eight R's are not explicit objectives with precise targets to be met. They are rather guiding principles that condition our international strategy whether that concerns a simple, narrowly focused bilateral collaboration or whether it concerns the building of broadly based activities at the institutional level within the International Alliance. In a spirit of conviviality, that's all we need. The academic, professional and student communities can lead on the substance. In finishing, let me end where I started. When the university was first established, Albert Sloman also said this. Our first students will still be in positions of influence and responsibility in the first two decades of the 21st century. In those distant days, 40 or 50 years ahead, their grandchildren may be at the University of Essex. They will know nothing of the bustle and bewilderment of the 1960s, nor even of the hopes and ideals which those associated with the university's foundation cherished. We should like them to feel that in our attempt at creating a new community of learning, we had a measure of success. He was right. Many of the university's students have gone on to lead and influence. And he was probably right that many of our current students 
and indeed academic staff, may know very little of our heritage. But their current opportunities, particularly their international opportunities, our global academic perspective and our convivial approach to such endeavours as the Alliance, can all be traced back to the very beginning. They have been a consistent theme in the intervening years. They are largely what marks the University of Essex out as unique and attractive, and they are, in great part, responsible for our level of success as an institution. And this commitment to internationalisation will be, I trust, central to our strategy in future as we, like you, continue to tread the path towards excellence. Thank you very much.